This episode is scripted by John Ruths and Neil Fisher and is narrated, recorded and edited by Neil Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 41 in which we will be introducing part 4 of the original novel and going through the first chapter, chapter 41, The Bridges. This last week has been interesting in our new home. I let our senior cat out after having been here for two weeks and he disappeared for three nights. We were convinced we'd lost him. Then on Wednesday morning he just reappeared. Appropriately his name is Loki, the Norse trickster god. There has been an additional thought from my partner in crime, John Ruth, following last week's episode. Quote, Do you think that maybe rabbits could feel the moon, as in could they possibly feel the electromagnetic effects? Might mean that they could also detect it during the daytime although being able to see it while the sun is in the sky is a non-issue. If so, an Adam's rabbit could seemingly speak about the moon with more knowledge, although the real purpose of having a visible moon in the sky would be light to see by, at least in my opinion. End quote. An interesting thought. I've also had a follow-up from Andrew Stevens, who got in touch at the end of September about classical references in Watership Down. I'm not sure if I mentioned you as as promised before. If not, I should have done. Andrew makes many many interesting points that will feature in future episodes. Just one more thing to add. I'm officially announcing the founding of the Warship Down podcast, Ausler, membership of which will be awarded to anyone who materially assists in the making of the podcast. The inaugural membership is as follows. Will Fuller, for early visions and an original offer to leave the Sandalford of solo podcasting. Rick Morris, for his wide patrols of Warship Down archives, Maxine Tubb, for her discovery of Lost Paragraph Elil, Sergal Ahad, for additional Lost Paragraph patrol work, Jeremy Downing, for expansion of the Warren through his extensive network of editions, as well as other patrols. Few have done more than Jeremy to expand our Warren, for which we are very grateful. Amber Ritzy, for successful scouting of RAR references, Rebecca Porter for her campion-like correction of patrol errors. Andrew Stevens for knowledge of classical flora and fauna, as just mentioned. An anonymous listener who got in touch about their relationship with the book after an abusive childhood. This was discussed in episode 32. You have earned your membership simply for courage. And finally, obviously, John Ruths, who is hereby appointed Captain of Ausler. I don't even need to say why, but I will anyway. He literally saved this podcast at a time of crisis, without which it would have had to become, Emily of Frith, bi-weekly. You truly are our bigwig, John, and the only other voice to appear on the podcast up to this point. This Ausler is always on the lookout for new members. You know what to do, and please let me know if I have missed you. This Ausler leaves no one behind. Introduction to Part 4 The opening events of Part 4 of Watership Down are entirely skirted over in the 1978 film after the punt breaks free on the River Test. So, if that is your main experience of the story, what follows will be new to you, as these events do not appear in any film portrayal of the story. The 1999 TV series portrays the River Escape in a way that is more or less irrelevant to the original book, and the 2018 Netflix series dispenses with the Escape by River altogether, which was unforgivable in the view of this originalist with revisionist tendencies. Once our heroes are back on the down, we will come to the very familiar climax of the book, events during which Hazel really does earn the title Ra. Fiverr's psychic abilities have their greatest impact since leaving Sandalford, and Bigwig thoroughly earns his retirement from fighting. We have reached the final act of Watership Down. Chapter 41. The Bridges. The opening quotation from an American folk song is simply about a boatman celebrating while going home, quote, with the girls. It kind of speaks for itself. We learn right away that the test is a pretty fast-moving small river. This definitely facilitates the getaway of our heroes, the ten new female additions to the Warren, we learn the actual number later in the chapter, and Blackafar as well. 
Most of the rabbits don't really know what is going on, but Woundwort and the host of Ephraphans are gone, so it really doesn't really matter very much. Interestingly, they instinctively get out of the water that is in the bottom of the punt. Now that Bigwig has succeeded in pulling off this escape, and had to use some quite extreme violence on the way out, he's totally spent, and lies beside Hazel in the boat. We get treated to a conversation between these two special rabbits, in which Bigwig says he couldn't do it again. Hazel replies that it will make a great story one day. One of the funnier parts of the book is when Hazel mentions, quote, clever rabbits, and Dandelion automatically knows to get Blackberry and Fiverr. It's probably not meant by Adams to be funny, but it can come across that way. It's also interesting that the rabbits are having conversations while underway. Rather than just waiting for the little punt to beach itself, or whatever else, Hazel and Blackberry are talking about what will come next. It also shows that the getaway is as far as their plan took them. This indicates that they had not considered what would come afterward. Heisenthle speaks up in a way that is both very Ephraphim, but also appropriately respectful to the group that she and the other does have just joined. She alerts Hazel that Kihar is coming, which he does. Kihar's warning about the upcoming bridge is important, as we shall soon sadly see. This is a low bridge. In fact, it is the same one they crossed when they first arrived at the test, and the punt may not be able to pass underneath. Hazel understands, and immediately tells the others to get to the bottommost portion of the boat. The boat bumps and skids its way under the bridge. Acorn is knocked into the lower part of the boat by, by the bridge, but is OK. Once again, Adams has selected a rank-and-file rabbit. We see from the conversation between Acorn and Hazel that Acorn is no longer the rabbit he was when they left Sandalford. Rabbits like Acorn, Hawkbit and Speedwell, clearly the least of the small Sandalford exodus, have all improved, and it is good that Adams takes the time to show us this where he is able to. However, one of the newly arrived Ephraim does, Thrayon Losa, seems to have been hurt, and Heisenthle is with her. Kihar warns of another bridge, and it seems this one will stop the little punt. It does, and Adams gives us a time and distance check. The boat has travelled just under half a mile in a bit more than 15 minutes, which also backs up the timings around the inappropriate use of the phrase Fuinlay from last week's episode. A fast walk is about four miles an hour, so 15 minutes per mile. In this case, the boat was drifted at, drifting at just under two miles per hour. Makes me think that if they, if the Afrofans had their own Blackberry, they might have pursued from the banks. Thankfully, this did not happen. How do you suppose Adams came up with that time and distance measurement? We might never know. He either just knew or maybe tested the theory out for himself. With the boat stopped, Hazel, Blackberry, Silver and Kihar discuss what to do. Richard Adams uses this moment to once again show us that in spite of the good relationship between Kihar and our rabbit heroes, they sometimes have difficulty understanding each other. Kihar thinks the rabbits need to simply get out of the boat and swim under the bridge. Hazel is not so sure, but he also demonstrates an understanding of how he guesses Kihar must see rabbits. These wet, bedraggled, cold and frightened rabbits aren't sure what to do, and this body of water seems to be moving swiftly. Bigwig is not his normal self at the moment, and we all know why. He's not there in this moment to offer himself up first, as he did at the crossing of the Embourne. In the same way that the rank-and-file rabbits have developed and grown, so of course have our major characters, and Fiverr is one of these. He's no longer the runty and scared rabbit that he's somewhat portrayed as in the earliest chapters. Over the course of this story, Fiverr has become more resolute and a rabbit that Hazel in particular has come to depend upon. Hazel's pride wound means his leg is not working well, adding even more to his anxiety. Just as he quietly offers to go first, things change, and some men pass over the bridge. This, fr this frightening, indeed for Hazel, almost unbearable moment passes, and Hazel come, comes to himself, telling everyone to disembark and swim under, swim under the bridge. They will just have to trust Kihar. We then get Hazel's point of view once he falls into the water with Pipkin. The way Adam descri Adams describes the fast-moving water as a force like a strong and silent wind is a testament to his writing and attention to detail. It turns out that swimming through the bridge allows them to easily reach a swampy piece of river bank. We know that Hazel has recovered himself when he exclaims, Good old Kiha! After an interesting exchange between Hazel and Blackavar, where the latter demonstrates some of the discipline advantages of being an Ephraphan, both rabbits work on getting the others out of the boat. Blackavar had just acted as, as if he was given an order. Moving back upstream to the other side of the bridge, Hazel reassures those still in the boat that it is OK and says the does must swim through first, with the injured doe, Thray and Losa, being escorted by Blackberry and Thethuthinang. Bigwig is truly spent at this point, and Silver has been looking after him. 
Firstly, he's been in Afrafa and his nerves were tested beyond their limit. And secondly, his wounded shoulder is really starting to get to him now. Silver helps him out of the water, at which point his comments to Hazel demonstrate the Afrafans how discipline works at the Warren on Watership Down. Everyone is out, and there really is nothing for it but them to rest in any dry place that they can find. Because of the overall wetness of where they are, it may luckily be a good place to not attract a lil. The group makes its way into the trough or space beneath a fallen tree. This at least does offer some shelter. Adams mentions that it took the warmth of their resting took on the warmth of their resting bodies, a way to empty, empty end this chapter that seems cosy. They all go to sleep. No watch rotations or anything like that. Collectively, they've just pulled off an operation that amazingly evolved planning, stealth, espionage, aerial reconnaissance, deception, and overall posture of security, movement on both land and water, and a lot of raw nerve. They're just too tired out to do anything but sleep. Next time, our heroes journey back to Watership Down, but they are not out of danger yet, and the Black Rabbit of Inlay isn't far away. Mm-hmm.